What is up, wrestling fans? Welcome to the Smart Cat Moment Smack Talk podcast, Hot Tags of the Week, episode 559. And we're just going to be digging into all of the news, speculation of the last week of wrestling. I am your host for this edition, Callum Wiggins. Joining me, as per usual, Robert D. Felice. Callum, we said last week that surely the wrestling news would come through for us with lots and lots of stories, and they did not disappoint. Yes, uh, we've got plenty to talk about. Not as much in terms of volume of topics this week, but some kind of meaty heavyweight stuff that we can really sink our teeth into. Of course, we are without uh, Mr. Mango, the head honcho of Smart Count Moment this week. He's still enjoying the last few semblances of his holiday in Brazil. So vacation, I should say. Vacation, holiday, whatever you want to call it. It's uh, depending on what part of the country you're from and wherever you're, uh, wherever part of the world you're listening in from. Hopefully you will want to be hitting that like button if you're watching on YouTube or drop in a comment below. Let us know your thoughts about any of the things that we're about to discuss on this edition. If you're listening to one of the more audio feeds like Spotify, iTunes, anything like that, uh, why not drop us a rating or do anything you can do on that uh, on those platforms to let people know that you're enjoying what you're listening to and get the world at, word out there. And we'll be filling your ears with a few other plugs as we go along. But let's kick things off with. I think a big story and we're breaking a bit of format here because we typically say show reviews and all these uh, just looking back at the week's television of wrestling towards the end of the show. But we have to start off with one because we need to talk about AEW Dynamite and AEW in general, because there's a lot of shit going down in this uh, in this promotion that is um it's a bit alarming considering what we have previously perceived the promotion to be. And a lot of it revolves around the opening segment of Dynamite, which was the CM Punk promo, which led to the brawl between him and John Moxley. And primarily it revolves around what Punk said right at the start of the promo, which was challenging Hangman Page to come out and challenge him for the title, Page not coming up, and Punk calling him a coward and all this stuff surrounding it. So essentially what it seems to be is that there's a lot of uh, rumour going out there. And I think it's been both said by Observer and backed up by Fightful was that Punk was not supposed to or had not been made anyone aware that he was going to call out Paige at the start of that promo, which is dicey. Put it that well, way. I think because like when I was watching it, I thought it was weird, but I also I thought it was like cool. Like it, it started off hot. It started off very intense. Um, Punk called out Paige. He waited for him, then seemingly just said, "Yeah, that's not cowboy shit. That's coward shit." And the apology needs to be as loud and as public as the disrespect. Mm. Now, I immediately had flashbacks to the build-up to Double or Nothing, where I had said, you know, for a babyface versus babyface feud, it got very personal very quickly, and it was mostly Paige just suddenly being like, I don't like you, and I'm going to defend this place from you. And now we're hearing that maybe that's not all entirely from a work perspective. Yeah, so the the whole fallout from this is that there a lot more stuff backstage has come up about Punk potentially threatening to leave the company over some unhappiness he's had backstage, basically saying that following the promo segments between him and Hangman Page in the build-up to uh, Double or Nothing, Punk basically saying, I, I'm not going to put him over, so you better have me win the title. So this is, again, leading to a lot of just overall speculation about how how things actually are behind the scenes in AEW. Like, is there a lot of discontent? Is there a lot of discomfort among wrestlers behind the scenes? And, I mean, again, we don't know the absolute inner workings of how things are going, but it does seem that there's this whole paradise for professional wrestlers or 
the, the fact that like, they're given more freedom and stuff like that seems to have a downside to it, which is it's starting to feel a little bit like inmates. I would say inmates running the asylum, but that this added freedom is coming with a lot of added tension between wrestlers that want to be who are very uh, i guess very protective of their characters and their spots which i guess is good in one way because a lot of people say that that was kind of the attitude around about in the attitude era and that's when wrestling was getting really hot and people were really like want to be protective of who they were and what they were doing but it also leads to a lot of tension and frustration and anger and clearly with this indication with um or at least what we're hearing about the punk situation does seem to suggest that one of their biggest stars one of the guys they've got in a huge contract and like who's been one of their top guys for the last year could be contemplating leaving at the very least yeah okay so it is important to say that as far as like the the leaving stuff mm. A lot of that was, like, locker room, I, I guess, retellings of the tension from the perspective of some in the locker room. Yeah, we don't, so we don't know, we don't know what Punk's actual feelings are towards this, like, and we don't, we're not saying that Punk will quit or is going to quit, but there at least was the feeling backstage that he might walk out on the company. My thing is... I, I I kind of feel like maybe people immediately jumped to the gravest conclusion, whereas, I don't know, maybe they just don't see eye to eye, and maybe Punk was like, all right, you made it super personal in the buildup, I haven't been here, so I'm back now, and I'm just going to give you a, a nice little, you know, a nice little shiner just to say, hey, I didn't appreciate it. And, you know, apologize and we can move on from there. Yeah, I think that could be the case as well. And, yeah, it's essentially like the verbal equivalent of a receipt. Pretty much just saying like, yeah, I didn't like that. Apparently this, a lot of this, again, it's just the feeling that stage, but a lot of this potentially revolves around a quote that... Page said in one of their promo exchanges about Colt Cabana, or at least referencing Colt Cabana. Well, okay, so I, after all of this and the constant reference of Colt Cabana, I, I went back and I watched both Hangman Page promos because if you remember, he cut a promo, then I think maybe he got COVID, but he had cut a promo. And then they didn't talk again until the face-to-face. -face. The initial promo was oddly intense, but there was no real, um, there was no real verbiage that was like, okay, there's something going on here. The face-to-face -face gets a little more awkward in that Hangman was like, you know, you talk a big game about workers' rights, but you've done the exact opposite since you've come here, and you know, I don't like you, and I'm defending this place from you. And Punk the entire time is just like, I don't know what your beef is with me, but I just want to win the title. Like, it, there's a very weird tension there. So while there's nothing specific said about Cabana, and I do want to make that clear, since it keeps all going back to Colt Cabana, it seems like Paige just got rubbed the wrong way by something. And we will, we should probably bring up again to add some fuel to this fire about this isn't really a, a a rarity for CM Punk, let's say. It's a guy who, he's a guy who by his own admission will speak his mind. It can be a bit of an asshole behind the scenes. And this can be that kind of, this coming to the surface a little bit towards Hangman Page. We obviously know the history that he has with Eddie Kingston as well, so... I would say that some people are extrapolating this to make some suggestions that Punk came into AEW to quote unquote put the young talent over and just because he has beef with one of those young talents means that he wouldn't be willing to put other young talent over, which I think is, well, it's 
it's it's it's visibly false. And in, which I think is very unfair. I think there is a, and this is my perspective of the fandom. I think there's a weird toxic positivity rally around it where it's like, well, you can't dislike Hangman Page because, as we've seen, Hangman Page is a great guy who does a lot of charitable stuff and has seemingly great viewpoints on a lot of major issues. But I, I don't think that that's fair to just be like, well, because of that, it doesn't mean that he can't rub anyone the wrong way. At the same time, I feel like because punk is this lightning rod, of course people just want to be like, yeah, you know, CM Punk being an asshole again. I saw so many people bring up the clips from Hunter in eleven in 2011 and Cena in 2012 where they both basically said, the only thing you want, the only change you want is to make yourself a star. And now I think it's important to say that, yes, while these clips are fun and cute, that those both were, you know, storylines that were completely structured around the idea of, hey, let's curtail this CM Punk thing. And I, I don't know, I think like a lot of people have jumped to, yeah, fuck CM Punk, which I think is egregious and ridiculous considering we just got the man back 364 days ago. You know what I mean? After seven years off, we just got him back. And Callum, feel free to tell me if I'm over the line here. But if this is truly all about Cole Cabana, are we really going to sit here and say that Cabana, prior to any of this, was doing any major ongoings in AEW? Because I see this take of like, oh, Punk got Cabana removed from TV, which, if true, does suck because... You know, if they had their personal issues, it should have been something that should be kept separate from the programming. But Cabana's also not making a major splash, and he is going to be better served in Ring of Honor, where I feel like more of the onus can be put on him and what he can bring to the product, because he wasn't doing anything in AEW. And that's not an indictment on Punk or Cabana or anyone, other than the fact that there's a lot of people that signed to AEW that they didn't really do much of anything with. Cabana just happens to be one of the more notable ones because of CM Punk being in the promotion. I definitely think that it's it's all it's not all about Cabana. And I I, I agree with you that if it was then it would just be a bit like that there are there are multiple factors that work and it's not just like, oh Punk and Cabana don't get along and so the entire the entire groundswell of AEW's locker room is completely disintegrated because of that one fractious relationship. I think it's just a case of, I imagine that there are certain people that, even though they understand the reasons for Punk joining and the popularity and obviously the fact that he is like a significant part of wrestling history, coming in, earning a huge amount of money, probably did rub some guys the wrong way and maybe they're not super keen on his attitude or it like just just personal differences or anything like that again you're not supposed you're not expected to or realistically in any sport or any 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 anything really any job you're not going to like every single person that you work with absolutely so, so you shouldn't so we shouldn't just like boil, boil over into thinking that because these two people don't get along or Punk doesn't get along with a few people, then it means that the whole fabric of AEW is going to collapse around this one guy. But having said that, you do have to kind of temper a little bit that you can't play favourites and allow Punk to go off script in the way that he did at the start of Dynamite without any kind of repercussions against him. Just because just because he is your biggest star and probably is one of your biggest earners doesn't mean that you shouldn't tell him, like, dude, what the fuck are you doing? That kind of like and Punk should accept that rather than just, you know, think that he can do whatever he wants because well, as he quoted in the uh, promo when he went to the exchange with Moxie that he's the dollar and cents of AEW. Like and and like there's still more to cover there, but I do wanna throw this on top of it. It does feel like recent 
hirings and restructurings were made to better better structure the dynamite shows and the shows because i know i believe i just read qt marshall is in charge of now scripting the shows now i'm sure there's always been a format but i had never heard of scripts in aew until this week and it seems like that's even something that aew would shy away from well it's something that they say well they seemingly need more structure i think that's something that a lot of people at least from the outside looking in could probably agree on because as there was indication on this dynamite and some previous dynamites go forward um a lot of people aren't really good at keeping their times or their time cues because as we saw in this episode of dynamite in particular the closing angle or closing segment of it was rushed to high heaven rushed to high heaven if you'd, if you'd almost say as well because of who was involved in it but it's um yeah there, there are certain things that segments are being cut short or being having to move all over the place due to the fact that certain people are i guess overstaying their welcome or at least like taking advantage of the fact that there maybe is that lack of structure that greater creative freedom there needs to be parameters in place and there needs to be some way of help holding people accountable for that as well so maybe we're getting to the point where AEW is no longer just like a friends club almost it's a now we have to start treating it as a it's a serious business with serious people company and i think that's where the disconnect comes in for some because from my perspective maybe it's you know cm punk is coming in here trying to elevate and maybe that does rub hangman page the wrong way when it's like it was kind of started as a boys club wasn't it it like it was just sort of started as okay it's the elite and chris jericho and these underutilized independent talents you know Mm. and i think you know well as we talk about the show we'll get into some of the other things said but I I think this is all part of the growing pains. And I've often said on this very podcast, this promotion completely outgrew its shell way too quickly. Yeah, I I think that, yeah, that this is an indication of the fact that they are growing to be more and more professional. And it's whether that the, the, the changes that are going along with it may be causing some tensions and fractures to form. And then also you have to consider the timing aspect of this period where a lot of people were now looking to WWE under Triple H's creative direction. They say, well, this is the new, fresh, cool company. It's still WWE. It's still the 50, 60 year old juggernaut, but it's it's got a new guy at the helm now. So this is the new exciting bit of wrestling. AEW's time in the as the the golden child of wrestling is seemingly over now. They're just a company. Obviously, a company that is producing very good television on a week-to-week basis, as we'll talk about when we get to the rest of the Dynamite, pretty much. But they're no longer everyone's favourite child in wrestling. Now, WWE is topped up, and they've got a fancy new sweater, and they've got all this other stuff, and they're, they've had a glow-up, let's say, and people are getting uh, behind them more than they were in the past. So, so that factor, the whole issues backstage build up towards like a big pay-per-view i I don't say people are turning on dynamite but people are now looking at it with far more critical eye than they potentially were in the past yeah and i think that again i i don't think it's fair i do think that the instant reaction and the instant noise from the community is unfair to all parties involved he says on a podcast i'm aware But, you know, (laughs) like, I do think that that is unfair because there is this immediate, like, oh, you see, you got to defend AEW because this is the people's promotion. Because I do think that there is this weird attachment that people have to AEW because they feel like it's theirs and it's their revolution, so to speak. But in the reality is it's a wrestling company and... They need to start making 
the best wrestling decisions. But one decision that I don't like as we continue to talk about the show is it looks like that unification match isn't taking place at all out, Callum. Yep, so we moved on into the actual promo segment between Punk and Moxley and then a pull apart brawl, which I thought was basically everything past the weird hangman start was just absolute top grade television. Just brilliant promos between both guys. It felt really real, it felt organic, it felt violence. Then their pull apart felt so well put together. And then they had one later on where they interrupted Tony Nice and like essentially just kicked their kicked more ass against each other and then it was announced later in the show that apart instead of all out where we all expected the match happened that the title unification match between cm punk and john moxley for between the existing world champion and the interim world champion will be taking place next week on dynamite in cleveland ohio yep and okay so I'll, i'll definitely let you talk about this and get your thoughts on it um, I think that this is a very, very odd, unexpected decision, but I'm not totally against it, but I'll let you explain why that you're not super into that, into this decision. So I think that what makes this decision strange is to go deeper into the punk promo and subsequent fallout. He spends the entire promo going, yeah, and at All Out, it's me and Moxley. At All Out, I'm going to kick your ass. Granted, Moxley does say, fuck it, let's do it right here, right now. And he and Punk again goes, nope, at the pay-per-view, I will kick your ass. And he even threw in the, the jab of, and you won't even be the first John I beat in Chicago for a world title or something to that effect. And that me and now this fallout and all this reporting is what makes the news slightly discomforting because it feels like oh god don't tell me they're rushing something in order to get something off of punk now granted we gotta wait to see the fallout of such but i i just feel like there's got to be a reason they're rushing to it and i'm a bit concerned so I, I can totally understand the concern and other people's concern about it. I, I don't understand the rationale behind it of like, well, why aren't they saving this for the pay-per-view? In the it, in a way, it's like saying like, well, this is the biggest match to do. Why aren't you putting it on the pay-per-view? And I would say to those people, you're going to get to watch this on free TV. Why the fuck are you complaining? But yeah. that, that's the, that, that sort of rationale I don't get. But I can understand people feeling, well, think about the reasons why they're doing it. Because there's clearly a reason they are doing it here. And it's a reason we're not privy to. And there's cl- they clearly have a plan for this, but we don't know what that plan is. And that's where the hesitancy comes in, because there are multiple. The reason why I'm somewhat excited or at least like I'm OK with this is because there's a million different directions they could take with this. And I don't know which one they're going to do. And that excites me. And because there's multiple paths they could take, they could do some kind of smart finish, which leads to need to have some kind of stipulation match at the pay-per-view. AEW doesn't do a lot of smalls finishes, so maybe they feel like they can get away with it because they've built up enough goodwill with the fact that pretty much all our matches have finishes. So if we end this in like a double DQ or a double count or something like that, then people will be still wanting to see the pay-per-view match, which I can kind of understand. But they could do something. I, there are some ideas that are spiraling around in my head, which is first idea, which I think would be quite cool if they did, because it would definitely lean towards CM Punk heel turn which I think there seems to be some inklings towards that anyway. But if Punk comes out the next night or or comes out next week or doesn't show up next week and basically says, I know showed because if I'm defending my title, it needs to be on pay-per-view. And he basically robs the fans of that match, all the fans in Cleveland from seeing that match because he says, if you want to see me defend my championship, it's going to be a pay-per-view. And that would just immediately turn him heel. And even though he'd get cheered in Chicago, at least we'd know going forward that this guy is is what everyone says he is. He is all about the money. So there's that direction. They could obviously do the smalls finish. There's talks about MJF because apparently, uh, at least from the Wrestling Observer newsletter, suggesting that MJF will be returning somewhat soon because they want to get the ratings up towards, well, get 
boost up the ratings in the fall and uh, winter in the build up to next spring where they'll start entering somewhat negotiations or at least putting feelers out there for a new television deal because I believe their current deal expires in 24. So that will get so that'll be the initial starting point. So MGF could get involved in this. And again, I think people have led that into thinking that MGF could be if that was was the case, that MGF would then be inserted into a triple threat match at all out. If that happens, I wouldn't be happy with it because I think total shots in AEW need to be earned. They shouldn't be handed out in the same way that has been in the case in WWE in the past. Can but, can they get away with it based on the idea that Max is the only person to have pinned CM Punk? I think they could get away with it, potentially get away with it like that. My perspective would be that if MJF did get involved, and I'm not against the idea of MJF getting involved in the match, but I get uh, my reasoning for it would be that MJF just wants to cause anarchy. He wants to ruin the show. This is the biggest match that Dynamite could ever put on. Would like they, they could build it as the idea this is the biggest match in Dynamite history, and MGF just gets involved, takes out both guys, like steals a camera or something like that. Does does basically all the stuff. Essentially, his own goal is to ruin the show by ruining this match. He doesn't want the title shot. He just wants to make Tony Khan's life hell, or make the show hell, and that's kind of his arc moving forward. And then you have the actual title match at all out. So MGF does his thing moving forward and he becomes like a guy who's infiltrating the show, trying to trying to break up in any way he possibly can. And things and, and then the rest of the shows happen around him. But that that's something they could do. They could just they could just have someone win and have a rematch at all out. I'm not against the idea of Moxley beating Punk quickly. And Punk essentially or punk cheating to win and then that leading into a rematch all out in some kind of more stipulation like steel cage that type of match but there are so many things that could happen and that's the thing that gets me excited is the unpredictability and very well there could be i mean they've built up a lot of goodwill with me so i'm not hoping for this or not expecting this but they could come up with a finish or an idea which is completely stupid and just not be good for the program or just in general. And I'll just, I will be the first person to come out on the hot tag next week and say, yeah, that was really fucking stupid. Or I'm really not excited about All Out now because of this. But I'm going to go in there with at least an air of excitement that they're going to do something interesting. My um, yeah. My other thoughts are potentially Tony, like, just has a hard on for a specific idea. And since Mox versus Punk was never the plan, maybe, yeah. And I, w- I wouldn't love this, but maybe the plan is um, Brian. And the plan was always Brian. So we're just going to get there. Is that that's an option? I mean, See, I, I I would I would I would I would uh, I think that you you're right that there could be something that's okay. I wanted this match for all out, and this isn't the match that I wanted for all out, and so we'll pivot towards that. I definitely don't think it's Brian because I'm pretty convinced it's going to be Brian Jericho. Oh, well, that is true. At all out. So, but but it could be someone else. We have no idea if like he had someone else in mind for the all out match against Punk, and they're just trying to fast track towards that. I think there's also a potential the punk might not be 100% and they're just trying basically he's going to come back have this match take a bit more time time off and then come back to fight for the title at full gear and again I don't know for certain if if that was a case I would have thought they would you know have his one off match at all out rather than on dynamite but yeah so so but uh, is there any other thoughts or any other things that you think could happen in this match Oh, well, we should probably also address Kingston because mm. one of the weird things that Punk brought up, because he had a lot of great digs in this promo. One of the yeah, things basically saying that, a, uh, go ahead. No, he's basically saying that Moxley is currently the third best guy in his group, and that's a situ- and that's a circumstance that he's uh, gotten used to over the years. That's, which then, is a great bomb. Mm. 
And then the one that you're alluding to, which is that uh, talks about not giving a title shot to his best friend, who is only the third best Eddie that I've ever been in the ring with. Which uh, uh, And then the, the second best Kingston I've ever shared a locker room with. Yeah. So a couple of those ones were obvious. So obviously one of the Eddies is Eddie Guerrero, because Punk has wrestled Eddie Guerrero back in the Ring of Honor. And he also obviously shared a locker room with Kofi Kingston. So those are the ones. The other Eddie is the other confusing one, because it could refer to a few people. Some people speculate it's Eddie Edwards. Uh, oh, well, I, I checked, and he's never been in the ring with okay. Eddie Edwards. He's been in the guy, the ring with a guy named Eddie Vegas. Mm. And like I had maybe that, because that's a name that kept popping up. And to me, the weird thing about that line was I hadn't seen anything on television that remotely alluded to, hey, Kingston wants a title shot. Mm. So is Punk going to be the guy now that has to give Kingston a title shot? But I would have thought if they're going to have the title shot, that wouldn't happen at all. It would happen at... In New York. Grand, yeah, in Grand Slam. Yeah. yeah. It, so, it's, there's a lot of interesting moving parts here, even if you you know, separate the quote-unquote real-life drama of it. And I'll be honest, as someone who loves, like, Brett and Sean stuff, I like it a lot better this way. I like it a lot better when I feel like, all right, there's some tension here, because I think modern wrestling did get too bogged down in. Well, we all know that everybody's really friends, no matter how, you know, no matter if Randy Orton kicks John Cena's dad in the head, we know that they're really friends. I'd much rather a situation where I'm not sure that these people actually like each other. But maybe that's just me. No, I think I think a bit of tension behind the scenes or a bit of real life animosity can add some intensity to a feud that you otherwise would have to completely manufacture. But again, it's it's trying to find a balance between doing that without people, you know, threatening to quit behind the scenes or uh, wanting to walk out on the company. So you need to find a bit of a balance between those things. So but yeah, as we said, it's going to be interesting whatever the, whatever action they decide to take. But I'd, I'd say that at least from the segment they had on this show, this this feud is well, this feud is like it's a match because they haven't really even had a chance to really start a feud yet. But this match feels like white hot. It's like the biggest thing that they've done recently, and I'm really excited. For, I'm really excited for Dynamite either way. Like you, you know that that this is a must watch Dynamite one way or the other so yep i'd be hard pressed to believe that they don't do like over a million again and everybody's watching dynamite because everybody wants to see what happens next with cm punk yeah so that was the big story coming out of dynamite but we might as well talk about the rest of the show because it was a noteworthy show outside of that even we had the two out of three falls match between brian danielson and daniel garcia which i will say is one of the best matches in dynamite history I, I, it's hard to say because Dynamite has had banger off the banger of matches, but I would say it's very much in the top 15, maybe. I believe that the first hour of Dynamite between Punk and Moxley, which basically went right into Garcia and Danielson, hmm. the best hour of television you could possibly watch in wrestling in 2021. Uh, 2022. Like, it, or 2021. Or uh, honestly, or 2021, because this match was so good. Everything felt intense and purposeful. And they made the DDT on the concrete feel important. One of the good things about guys just starting to, you know, play it again is that. It makes things feel so much more impactful when you can see the blood and the actual injury start to form. And I just thought that this was so good from Garcia full stop tapping out Danielson in the first fall to Brian having to squeak by in the second fall and then really kick it up for the third fall. I thought this was this is how you put over a guy, everything that they've done in the ring. It really puts over Garcia very well. 
And I have to say, objectively, after this match, the show went into full panic mode and just started cramming things in nonstop. And I think that that's where the structure completely falls apart. Yeah, I would, I would agree. But just just to talk about this match a little bit more. It was the fact that obviously the AEW show was tied in with the premiere of House of the Dragons, the new Game of Thrones series, which is uh, coming up. And it's again funny that you had the drag, uh, the American Dragon versus the Dragon Slayer, and he won the first fall with Dragon's Leaper. So that's that's a lot of uh, good tie-ins there. Then you had the like uh, Jericho come out when they were going to offer a handshake to each other. Jericho takes out Danielson, which is why I think that's the match at all out. But Daniel Garcia pulled Jericho away, saying don't beat him, beat him up anymore. Crowd started chanting, like, this is one of the best chants of the year, is the you're a wrestler chant. Just like, okay, we know where we're going with this guy. This guy's over now. This guy feels in the same way that you have felt when he joined the Blackpool Combat Club. And the match between, if there is going to be a match, which I feel like there will be between Jericho and Danielson at All Out, it's not going to be, quote-unquote, with the custody of Daniel Garcia on the line but this will be the match where Garcia does turn his back on sports entertainment and embraces his wrestler side and joins the Blackpool Combat Club on, off the back of this but yeah I thought as I say the first hour of Dynamite was just perfect professional wrestling yeah and like, amazing promo segment at the start fantastic match and fantastic angle at the end of that match just all match. perfect and fantastic start to finish and then yeah then things started to go off the rails a little bit so we had Vasty Blondes versus the Gun Club where the Gun Club beat them in about 30 seconds which basically tells me yeah Vasty Blondes are getting out of this company probably pretty soon like I don't know what they stand to be in this company anymore they're they're jokes and they've been jokes since uh, Julia Hart walked out on them so that's that's about that's about all it stands to them you had uh, Billy Gunn congratulate the gun club. Soaky Hathaway comes out, gives the signal. They beat up their dad. Uh, My favorite thing like, about this is Billy is so big mm. that Austin goes to hit him, and he's the one that falls over. <laughs> <laughs> like, it just it kind of took a little bit away from the angle, but I just thought that that was hysterical. But yes, yeah, so they beat him up. The acclaim come out to make the save. The acclaimed reunited Billy Gunn with the scissor me daddy ass gimmick. And the crowd loved it at the very least. But I do have to say, why the fuck is this on Dynamite? Yeah, I'll agree this, with that. I mean, this is Rampage at best level stuff. And like, we'll talk about this as well. We'll might as well talk about this, even though it's not the specifically the next segment. But Tony Storm and Kylan King have a match on this show. And like it's your typical 9.30 women's match where you're just like, throw, OK, let's throw two women out there and just let them do some stuff for a little while and then forget that we even have a women's division by the rest of the show. And I'm just thinking, why the fuck is this on there? Why don't you feature women? Why don't you actually do stuff with women, build feuds with women, tell stories with your women's wrestlers? Do fucking something because we're building towards this Tony Storm... Uh, Thunder Rosa match no all out. Fuck. Yeah, and no one cares because they, their story is, oh, we're tag team partners, but now we're going to have to fight for the title. It's like, you're not actually telling the story. You had Thunder Rosa on this show for like 30 seconds at most, really. You're, you're champion, and that seems to be what she gets more more often than not. You've got no involvement with Britt Baker or Jamie Hayter. They seemingly have fallen off the face of the earth in the last two weeks. Where the fuck was is the Ruby Riots, Anna Jay... Uh, Ruby Wright. Oh, that's sorry. right. They were doing that. Anna J, Ty Conchi, Ty. Oh God, it's the uh, Ty Mello stuff now. Where's uh, Where's Hikaru Shida? She's wrestling on Dark for some reason. Why was there a fucking Dark match between Hikaru Shida and Thunderstorm versus Nyla Rose, Emi Sakura, and uh, Marina Shafir? Why isn't that on Dynamite or Rampage? What What are you doing putting that on Dark Elevation? Again, I will say this company completely outgrew its shell way too quickly. And I think that the women's division does get lost. And I, I want to emphasize this. I like the trio's belts. Fine. Whatever. They do not need... Well, well, no additional women's championship will solve your problem here. Don't tell me that a women's tag title 
is going to do it because it's just another belt. You don't need belts. You need to tell stories. You need to, like if you're going to add a tag tip, but title belt, fine. But, you know, actually build stories around it and have the tag champions be in feuds and be featured on television. Don't just give them titles and think that that makes them feel more important because we know from WWE in the last two years that doesn't work. And especially now with Triple H at the helm, the women on your competition are about to be featured more heavily and more seriously than potentially ever before yeah, as I say, potentially on ever. main roster television. And you've got Impact that is consistently doing great stuff with their women's division and featuring them as like top stars in the company. Fucking do better. You can do better. You can, you've got people in your roster that are very talented wrestlers, so do more with them. Uh, but then I also say to, uh, in regards to the next segment, to the AEW audience, uh, be better as well, because what the, f- like, watting Jungle Boy in his promo. Oh, bro. Yeah. Again, this, this show, first hour, emphasized everything I love about AEW. Second hour emphasized everything I genuinely dislike about this product. One of which is the fan base, and another of which I love him to death. But Jim Ross <laughs> needs to, uh, honest, Cat Callum, he needs to stop. He, 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 he does get a little bit tiresome in some places, like uh, for some reason mentioning thigh slapping and stuff like that. He went through this whole fucking show with just the surliest attitude. And you mentioned the thigh slapping, which he said during the uh, the Danielson and Garcia match, where he's like, this is real wrestling. Nobody's slapping their thigh, which is, is a fine dig. But it's also like, I don't think we need to mention thigh slapping in our commentary, or have we just gone that meta? But during this Jungle Boy segment, where Jungle Boy is unfortunately getting thrown off to the crowd in their wedding just because... They, they just, wrestling fans today, just have to get themselves over. And Christian comes out, and he's obviously going to say no. And Jim Ross is like, well, how's he going to say no? What? Well, that doesn't make any sense. And right on cue, Christian goes, my answer is no. And then JR just immediately, oh, see? He said no. See? <laughs> it's like, yo, I don't need this taking away from the segment. And I'm sorry, but at this point, that takes away from the segment. Yeah, and this this wasn't the strongest segment between Christian and Jungle Boy leading into what will inevitably be their match at All Out. Uh, Jungle Boy, he's, he's, not, he's never been the strongest promo, and the crowd got to him, and that was a shame to see because, you know, he's he's a very good babyface and a very good worker, and it's 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 hard to see that happening. But... Then the, the the brawl as well. This probably wasn't helped by the fact that there'd been a much better pull apart earlier in the show. So when these two started going out and the security guards rushed out again to try and deal with this one, I would have found it quite funny, actually, if the security guards rush out to do this and then we see behind the scenes that Punk and Moxley have found each other again and started beating each other up because the security guards were busy doing something else instead. That might have made it work. But the fact that like this was just a, a weaker pull apart in a show which had already seen a much more intense and much better uh, better produced one the this kind of actually deflated their rivalry more than it helped to them but hopefully it picks up again at least in the build-up to all out and it's worth mentioning that luchasaurus is currently quote-unquote suspended uh, due to his attack on pat buck the previous week so there's that to be considered as well then we have the storm killing king match storm one so that's just her building up towards her title match and then we had the next most noteworthy thing, uh, AEW Trio's title tournament quarterfinal, first match in the tournament, uh, La Faction in Gobernabla with uh, Andrade, Rush and Dragon Lee taking on the Young Bucks and the return of Kenny Omega. He's back. Kenny is back. He's part of the Trio's tournament. Uh, I'd like to Justin Roberts' intro because you're supposed to imagine that he doesn't know that Kenny Omega's back, and then he sees the sheet of paper in front of him and goes immediately into Kenny Omega entrance mode. So that was fun. North Carolina and all that stuff. And then they have a fun match where they tell the story that Omega has got ring rust and maybe not be 100%, so he was doing things like 
slipping up when he went for the uh, you can't escape move and a few other bits and pieces as well. But overall, it's just a fun six way, six man party match. Lots of cool spots, lots of cool double team and triple team maneuvers. Uh, Kenny finishes off Dragon Lee with the one winged angel. He struggled. I mean, obviously, part of the gimmick. But like, he struggled mm. through that one winged angel. I think they were telling the story with that one as well that um, Dragon Lee was was feigning being pretty much knocked out after a uh, V trigger. And a lot of people were thinking that, like, he was selling so well on that, people thought that he'd actually gotten knocked out. I, w- I will say, well, I'll echo what. Uh, Brian Alvarez said on his uh, review of AEW Dynamite, you cannot get a guy who is dead white, complete dead white on your shoulders if he's not helping you. So I think um, I think he was just really doing really good selling of that. And Kenny Omega was doing good selling of being just about able to get him back up onto his shoulders and hit the move. But Wait, Are you good with them telling this story? Because I kind of feel like he's been gone almost a year. Logically, if you're not ready at this point, you didn't need to rush back, and I feel like it's weird of your friends to make you rush back just for Trio's titles, you know? I, I've, I'm i fine with telling the story that he's got ring rust, and that he needs it's to get back into like ring injury. shape. Injury, like he's still hurt that it did ring rust. Um, I think it's a, yeah, I think that he wants to test himself, and even though he may not be 100%, I'm, I'm kind of okay with that, and I think that we'll go from in the weeks leading up to All Out, he's going to shed more and more of that protective armour that he's got on at the moment. And it will eventually be, okay, we're back to, by the time All Out rolls around, I think we're back to best bout machine, Kenny Omega. But I'm fine with them telling the story that he needs to still work a little bit and he was not quite 100%, but he'll soon get there and he's got to work at it a bit more. But yeah, this match was a lot of fun. The Elite win, as you'd expect. And then because the fact that time was running short, we kind of had to rush through the angle at the end of it, which was uh, Andrade hitting Dragon Lee with a uh, hammerlock DDT. Dragon Lee's mask flies off. They beat him down a little bit. And so that's Did the... we need this? No, but I think <laughs> they, they've they been telling the story about... Um, uh, that they're obsessed with taking people's taking, masks taking, off? Yeah, taking a bit of masks. And obviously we had, um, had Dragon Lee versus Roosh at uh, Ring of Honor's last show, so they seemingly are going to be do- potentially doing more stuff with Dragon Lee, which makes sense. He's obviously was part of Ring of Honor before their disbandment. He was he's part of New Japan as well, so I think that they'll do stuff with that faction moving forward. But I don't think we needed to see it at the end of this show. I think, but you know, they like to put angles on pretty much every match to make them seem a bit more worthwhile. But you didn't really need it in a tournament quarterfinal where the the whole story was Kenny Omega's back and they they're going further in the tournament. So so but overall, I'd say overall fun show, like good show. I enjoyed the vast majority of it. But as we've alluded to, there were there was a, a a void in the middle of this show where a lot of stuff just either didn't make sense or didn't feel like it was worthy on being of being on Dynamite at all. I agree, and ultimately the, the good outweigh the bad, but, like, there there were some things on this show where I'm like, all right, we need to clean this up. Granted, you can't do anything about an audience that wants to what your baby face, even though they genuinely like the baby face, but at least do something about JR. What have happened to him just appearing in the second era of Dynamite? I guess they didn't like that format because they did that for about two weeks and then he did all of Dynamite and then Rampage too. Mm. But then again, like, we don't know. Maybe, because there's some weeks where he's on fire. Maybe all the backstage stuff gets to him in a way that just makes him go cranky when he's on air. Maybe. Well, if you don't want us to be cranky, you would have uh, already have hit that like button and hit subscribe as well if you haven't already on the YouTube channel. And you could also, to make sure that we're definitely not cranky and we're actually full of gratefulness and happiness, be checking out the Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash smartcatmoment. You can give us anything, amount that even just a dollar a month is always greatly appreciated. But if you want to stretch the boat out a little bit more, there's the $5 tier, which gives you like ad block forgiveness. 
there's a ten dollar tier which gives you access to all the dark cars material the extra uh, additional podcasts that we do typically once a month but sometimes a little bit more and get access to all of those in the archive i think we're up to about 20 something between 20 and 30 episodes there so that's hours of additional material that you can listen to and then at the 50 dollar tier the pick a poison tier you can basically command us like your puppets on strings to do any podcast any show like any a show review a special edition of like i don't know play the game or a special mount rushmore or tier list or anything along those lines a mock draft anything you'd want from us or a particular article anything on the website as well just that's completely the world is your oyster at that point within reason but we'll pretty much like be at your beck and call so check out the patreon as well that's uh the youtube members that's the youtube side of this as well so you can if you sign up for a membership you definitely get also access to all the uh dark cast episodes as well and if you want to spend some money with us in a bit more of a sporadic way there's always the patreon not always the patreon we always talk about the patreon always the merchandise shops at redbubble and t public where you can pick up some smart cat moment merchandise just walk around with our logo brandished all over your body or on your shower curtain or on your fridge magnets or anything like that okay a few more plugs out of the way because there is still plenty of news we've only really talked about the AEW stuff right now so there's plenty more to get going uh and we should start off with the potential death of NXT UK so it's like the the NXT UK is a Pokemon that is currently in the middle of evolving I I, that's how I will phrase this because can I phrase it slightly differently go ahead I'll phrase that slightly differently, where I believe that NXT UK is a Pokemon that is currently evolving that will die halfway through its evolution. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, ah. because, because, so, essentially, for people that aren't aware, um, we spoke about this last week, that NXT UK had to cancel um, its two most, well, two upcoming sets of tapings due to uh, interference at the place where they would uh, record those shows. And now it has been announced that NXT UK is going on a temporary hiatus and they have also released a considerable amount of NXT UK talent. We also see saw a lot of NXT UK talent appear on the latest episode of NXT or the NXT Heatwave special. But if I can quickly do, I'll go through the list of people. And this is according to uh, WrestleTalk.com that they have a list put together here. So. This is the following names that have been released from the company, at least according to their website. So we have Flash Morgan Webster, Mark Andrews, Wild Boar, a male, uh, Jack Stars, Dave Mastiff, Ashton Smith, Amelia McKenzie, Shah Samuels, Nina Samuels, Sam Gradwell, Danny Luna, Primate Jay Melrose, Rohan Raja, Kenny Williams, Zia Brookside, Tailman, Trent Seven, Tyson T-Bone, Sid Scala, Saxon Huxley, Eddie Dennis, and Amir Jordan. So, so, like, not all of these have been confirmed because this this one was a little different. It wasn't Sean Ross Sapp letting everyone know through Twitter. It was them announced the, 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 the talent, talent themselves. themselves. Yeah, come out. And yeah, say. which I think is way better. But I I feel bad for a lot of these talents, especially like Trent Seven, who I think was, you know, one of the top guys in NXT UK. Uh, I I will preface this by saying I like the overall plan for, you know, the expansion of this, because I think that's what they wanted to do to begin with. But seeing so many people go, I think, is an unfortunate side effect of this. Well, my big question about this whole NXT Europe, which is the apparently the evolution this is going to go through to become more expansive is who's going to wrestle on this show because they just seemingly have released all the people they would feature on this show and that's the thing that is my little bugbear about it maybe i'm overthinking it but it just does give me the sense of well if you're planning on doing a relaunch in about i don't know how many months time to a big nxt europe like surely you'd want to have a Flash Morgan Webster, a Mark Andrews, a Trent, Trent Seven, a male, a male was French. Like, why is why would she not be featured? Like this, 
the, the UK, as far as I'm aware, is part of Europe. We, we, a lot of us apparently don't like that, but um, there's, <laughs> but, but as far as I'm aware, we are part of Europe. So a lot of these people would be part of this NXT Europe expansion. So why are they being released from their contract? And it seems that, as we'll talk about when we get onto the Heat Wave review, that there are a lot of people from NXT UK that seemingly have transitioned over into the actual NXT, or it, whether that's temporary or permanent, they seem to have, quote-unquote, picked their favourites and moved them over to the actual NXT or the main show or anything on, along those lines. And the other, the, basically the entire team, remainder of NXT UK have basically been told that, yeah, we, your services are no longer required. So if they are moving into Europe, then who are they actually having join the European roster? Again, I'm not saying my knowledge of European wrestling is is exhausted by any stretch of imagination. Most of it is UK based, but I don't know what they're planning to do if they're releasing all this talent. Unless they have plans of bringing some of them back in several months time, but it just feels a bit callous to release them in the meantime rather than just continuing to pay them because you're pretty much paying them to do virtually nothing anyway because virtually nobody was watching NXT UK. So because of the fact that they were announcing the talent themselves, I got the vibe, and I could be totally wrong here, that they gave them the out, like, hey, this is what we're doing. Do you want to be a part of this? And maybe some of that talent was just like, well, nobody's been watching NXT UK, so I'd rather take a chance on myself. That's, again, I I would respect the people that do do that. I don't think it'd be this many people, if that, that was true. the case. Because, uh, and again, you may not know the situation in the UK as well as I do. Um, our economy's fucked. Like, in multiple different directions, it's been, it's like, it's fucked in the earlobe type of fuck, that kind of, <laughs> like, there's no more holes to be going through, that that's how, like, that's how much in the shit we are, in, like, with fucking energy bills are going to be multiple times bigger than they have previously been, there's the, um, rate of inflation has hit double digits for the first time in about 40 years, like it's it's trouble right now and a lot of these people are going to find it difficult to find work outside of the uk and it's not as if the uk independent wrestling scene is thriving that much at the moment for them for them to get a consistent amount of work or at least a consistent paycheck that they would have been getting from wwe so i highly doubt that a lot maybe it's the case of some of them but i highly doubt all of them left of their own accord put it that way yeah, well, when you put it like that, I mean, I'm more inclined to definitely believe you. And it's, um, just, it's also the phrasing about all them saying, like, thank you, WWE, and all this stuff. It doesn't sound like the, a, a bunch of people that feel like they're coming back to the company in a few months' time, or could come back to the company in a few months' time, which is why I'm just, I just think NXT Europe is just going to be a promise like NXT India or NXT Japan was, which is like... Okay, we, in, in an ideal world, we'll definitely get around to it, but we're probably not actually going to do it. Well, considering the fact that the company released PR surrounding it, I think they will get to NXT Europe. I think if they have their way, it's the first step into getting back with the idea of an NXT India and an NXT, or maybe if we're just going continentally, NXT Asia. And then next, you know, whatever. But I, I think that this is a first step kind of thing to what they've wanted to do for a while. I just don't know if they'll get the chance to pull it off the way that they want to. Yeah, I, I, I just think this is just an empty. Like, I, I'm more than happy to be proven wrong, but it just the initial impression I'm getting is this is an empty promise. And it just feels like like you, your UK should be the base of NXT Europe because of the fact that you've already got an established presence there. And you've got, I don't know if they still have, but they had a performance centre there. So surely that should be the heart of this expansion. Like you shouldn't have to release two thirds of the roster 
before you can make this expansion possible. You can you have the resources to keep them all under contract for as long as it takes to get this project off the ground. And so, yeah, just uh, yeah, I, I just think that uh, we'll we'll wait and see. We'll see sometime in 2023 if this has become a reality. But I'm not going to hold my breath. Let me put it that way. Well, we do know that we're getting an even busier Labor Day. Mm. Because not only do we have All Out, but we have Worlds Collide. Yes, yeah, so we might as well transition this over into uh, the whole heat wave discussion as well, because there's a lot of uh, UK related implications going into that. So heat wave started off with uh, Kamala Hayes defending the North American Championship against Giovanni Vinci. A uh, decent match between two of the better workers on the show, and it ended with interference with like Trick Williams getting involved, which allowed Melo to get a head to the takedown and get the victory. So yeah, decent match between two good workers. Can't really complain too much. I then agree. Ha- yeah. Then we had the first um, UK involvement because we had Diamond Mine have a conference in the ring where it seemed like they were finally about to turn on Roderick Strong when Gallus interrupted, so, and that is all three members of Gallus, that's the Coffee Brothers and Wolfgang, got involved, took out Diamond Mine, then took out Roderick Strong as well on a three and one beat down. So they're here. They also had a backstage segment later on where they essentially called out um, Briggs and Jensen. And so essentially what I'm inferring from that is they're going to beat uh, uh, Briggs and Jensen for the uh, NXT UK Championships next week, and then that's going to be a unification match. That is correct. That, that is exactly where I would assume they're going as well. Yep. Uh, we had Roxanne Perez versus Cora Jade. Uh, as I anticipated, Cora Jade got the victory through shenanigans when she DDT Roxanne. Very sad about that. Mm. No, but she did DDT Roxanne on a stick, and that was that was enough to to beat Roxanne. You know what I didn't like about her DDT and Roxanne on a stick was that the referee was watching. Yeah, and no, I'm like, the referee watching it and also then watching her press the stick into into Roxanne's head while she was pinning her. Yeah, I'm like, bro, do your job. Like, what what was that? That was a very, very, I was not going to say rare miss, but that was definitely a miss from the WWE referee side of things. I mean, you say it's a rare miss. I mean, they've been telling the story recently. The referees are incompetent and can't see pinfalls and stuff like that pretty recently. <laughs> so Jeff Jarrett's just going to call matches on NXT now. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then we had the street fight between Santos Escobar and Tony D'Angelo, where weapons could actually be used. And they were used in the finish of this match, where both Santos and Tony D go for uh, the weapons of choice. So they go for a, a crowbar and brass knucks at the same time. Either they both connect at the same time or Tony gets the better of it with the uh, crowbar and pin Santos, gets the victory. Santos has now been banished from NXT. Well, I hope he, that he's going to get called up, that it's going to be great. Oh, he definitely should get called up because he's, I mean, we've, we've I think there, there's been people speak about this quite a lot, is that they need a top Hispanic star that's not Rey Mysterio. Because Ray's obviously grey, but Ray is nearly fifty at this point, mm-hmm. and so they probably need a a fresh face. And he is a Hispanic sensation who speaks phenomenally good English. Yeah. So, so that's basically what they want. So hopefully he does well on the main roster, and hopefully at least in time he's joined by Legado. But I we'll will. see how that I goes. I assume that he will be. Uh, we had the NXT Women's Championship match. Mandy Rose defeated uh, Zoe Stark to retain her championship by using a knee brace to the head. Again, not disqualification. So, <laughs> but I guess it's a knee brace and Zoe Stark was wearing it, so that's understandable. But I, I, I guess I did expect Rose to retain, but I thought there'd be more shenanigans involved in it than that. But the big story coming out of this is that apparently there's been an injury suffered by Zoe Stark, either during this match or in the build-up to this match or post this match, whatever happened, and that they are, her and Nikita Lyons are no longer involved in the tournament for the WWE Women's Tag Team Championships, instead taking their place on the upcoming episode of SmackDown, which will be on after we finish recording, will be what who we assumed would be in this tournament in the first place, Toxic Attractions, Gigi Dolan, and JC Jane. And 
I'm sure they'll probably lose because they weren't in the tournament to begin with. And yeah, uh, Natalia and Sonia were. But I would I would really use this as the catalyst to move Mandy back to the main roster and move the Toxic Attraction girls up. Because build your women's division, show faith in that women's division, and I'm sure, you know, they'll be able to reap the rewards of that rather quickly. And that's what I would rather see from this, you know? Because Natty and Sonya are great. But even if it's like, what is it, Raquel and Aaliyah? Mm. So, like, even if you do that, Raquel and Aaliyah versus Toxic Attraction is a fresh match to the main roster audience. So that's something I would definitely be going for. So the more that, um, as the tournament progressed, because we might as well mention on Raw, we had, um, we'll go back to actually doing a full Raw review, but we had Alexa Bliss and Asuka defeat. Uh, do drop and Nikki ASH, which I did not expect because I thought that neither of those teams would be in the tournament because there's going to be a six woman tag at uh, Clash of the Castle. But I guess the tournament final is not taking place at Clash of the Castle, it will be taking place on just some episode of Raw or SmackDown. So we'll see how that goes. But it does mean that I'm probably leaning more towards EO and Dakota winning, which would make sense. And that means that the team they'd likely face in the finals would be Raquel and Aaliyah because they're, baby, they're the only baby faces on that side of the bracket left. So, but we'll see how that goes. Uh, but Rose Wan, Stark, if Stark is injured, hopefully it's not as long-term as a previous injury was. But we'll have to wait and see. We've already had, like, Chris Statlander have a reoccurrence, or not a reoccurrence of injury, but another serious injury. So hopefully the same has not befallen Zoe Stark. Uh, they were also saying that Nikita is not medically mm. available, which Twitter yeah. has just taken to meaning, oh, yeah. yeah, she's not vaccinated. Yeah. And they're, they're in Montreal, so that's happening here. Oh, right. Okay. That, yeah, that makes a, uh, that does make sense. Again, don't want to speculate too much on that front because, but yeah, it would, it, it would make sense. And this can be our, uh, I guess, uh, frequent opportunity to say, Hey kids, get vaccinated. Yes. Just a little pin, just a little pin break. Doesn't hurt too much. And uh, so, yep, that match is over. Uh, interesting as well is the fact that uh, Mandy Rose has now passed over 300 days to champion. Yes. Which makes her one of the longest champions. I think it's only uh, Shayna Baszler that's held it for longer than she has. Is she really number two? Uh, I'll have to just double check that just to be certain. But I know that... Uh, I think maybe Asuka? Uh, I'm trying to remember, like, because I, I don't think Asuka's reign was actually that long, because it was less than a year, because she won it at uh, the WrestleMania, where the WrestleMania uh, show was, was, and then held it until about September, October time, I think. But that's, uh, again, have, that was several years ago, so I might be a little bit off of my uh, things there. So, so yeah, uh, let's see. Asuka held it. Oh, actually, actually, Asuka did hold it longer than I expected, 510 days. So maybe, she, yeah, maybe I just, a whole year got blocked out of my mind. So, yeah, so you have Asuka with 510. You have Shayna Baszler with 416. Uh, then, actually, you have uh, Paige and EO both have over 300 days, whereas Mandy is currently sitting on 297. So we'll get, close, get past 300 by the end of, by the time the next show's around. So Mandy is currently fifth on the list. And probably, and within the next two weeks, we'll go third on the list. That's insane that Paige held it for that long. Because mm. you don't think, cause because of the fact that NXT was on Hulu in the States, no one thinks, oh, super long reign when they think of Paige. Well, technically, the days that she's recognized the champion is 273. Because uh, she won it on that tournament, and then on tape, it was uh, on tape delay. Didn't go out until about a month after the tournament actually happened in real life. So, so t- technically, by WWE standings of things, Mandy's already fourth, and she and uh, by this time next week, she would have surpassed Io Shirai. So, uh, you know, like I know, like Mandy, it's not been your cup of tea, mm. but. It is the best thing they've done for Mandy. 
who's been on that with that company for a long time, you know? Oh yeah, good for her. I'm, 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 again, I know. I mean, that genuinely is like, yeah, it is like it's good that she has something to show for the fact that she has been in WWE and she has that accolade to her. But again, I'd rather someone who was a good wrestler was holding the title. That's kind. That's just my perspective. But yeah, and then main event we had. Oh, we should also talk about the fact that uh, there was a backstage segment with Indy Hartwell. Uh, where she got a love letter from Dexter Loomis, who's back in the company, and this was ripped up in front of her by Blair Davenport. Which was fantastic. I'm so, glad she's... Like, she could take over and be a major star, and I'd be all for that. And then the main event, we had Bron Breaker pretty comfortably beat JD Madonna for the yeah. championship, so really the most interesting thing that happened is that J.D. Madonna seemed to get off with the fact that he was bleeding and uh, allowed Bron Breaker to spear him and power slam him. So, yeah, Bron Breaker retains. And his uh, celebration was interrupted by Tyler Bate, who was holding the NXT UK Championship, despite the fact that on TV, yeah. the NXT UK tournament has not concluded yet. Nope. So, spoiler and, alerts for anyone who was watching NXT UK. And this is right about the time where you go, okay, this is where they're just basically saying, yeah, fuck it. Fuck UK. But... You know, I I look forward to Bate versus Breaker. I think Breaker will soundly win, but I look forward to that. And yeah, I'm looking I'm looking far more forward to that than I was this match. Yeah, and I think Worlds Collide will actually be a fun show. So, yeah. you know, good for them. I I'm hoping that this is the start of NXT resurging back to what we enjoyed. So I, yeah, I, I definitely think the NXT. Uh, 2.0 shows have been better in the last uh, couple of months or so. But so for a world's collide, at least just initial speculation, we'll know more as and when Labor Day weekend approaches. But I'm assuming Gallus versus the Creed Brothers to unify the tag titles. Uh, obviously, it seems like we're going to have Ron Breaker versus Tyler Bates to unify the NXT and NXT UK championships. And then we get to the women's title. So we have not yet seen Mako Satamora appear on uh, NXT. So, in it's is she currently she she is still currently the NXT. UK I believe she is still champion. currently the champion. I don't think they did anything because I think if they had switched it over to uh, Blair, they would have just had Blair with the belt. Yeah. So I'm just gonna double check quickly. So yeah, Mako is still currently the NXT UK. Uh, women's champion she has not yet appeared on NXT so but you would imagine it would make sense for it to be her versus Mandy Rose to unify those championships so so yeah I, I expect I, by the way I'd be all for the idea of oh, uh, totally down NXT Samara. champion <laughs> you know Becca Santamara oh yeah uh, I'd, I'd or totally Blair Danford yeah but um We'll see how that card shapes up. So, yeah, definitely going to be a, a busy, busy weekend for everyone. Uh, we've got, like, so it's, so that's uh, the day after Clash of the Castle, right? Yep. And I wonder same day if the Clash will take place in the, uh, the UK. Uh, that'd be fun. Yeah, they're going over there anyway. Like, that'd be nice. Yeah, you would have thought they'd have, like, the stadium announced then or well, they would you we would know that it's it's happening there so we'll wait, we'll wait and see i'm i'm just assuming it's just going to take place at the 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 capital wrestling center like they've been doing all the other places but we'll, we'll yeah we'll we'll wait and see could be interesting so that's heat wave and let's uh move on to some other news so we'll talk a bit new japan some interesting stuff in New Japan, which caps off really with Okada winning the G1 Climax, defeating Will Ospreay in the final. And yeah, that's pretty much what we expected. We expected and it would be Okada. You were also correct in that Tama beat Jay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just thought it just made sense. Like you, you, The story you're clearly telling is that it's going to be the rematch between Okada and Jay White at Wrestle Kingdom, so why would you have them fight each other in the semi-final match beforehand. It just didn't make any sense to me. So 
you had Tamatonga get the victory of Jay White, which means that Tamatonga will get a title match against Jay White in the uh, sometime during the fall. And Okada will probably defend his briefcase against uh, Jonah, because Jonah was the, I believe, the one guy to defeat him in their block as well. So at least those are some matches to look forward to. Um, yeah, I, I haven't actually uh, checked out the, the final match yet, but I probably will do because Okada versus Will Ospreay sounds like my type of thing. Yeah. And, and we have Ospreay, and we have uh, Ospreay going to be popping up on Dynamite soon as part of the uh, Trios tournament with... Um, I think it's oh. next week. Is it next week or is it week after? Yeah. Well, it's got to be uh, soon because... Yeah, it's, 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 I think it's next week, but I don't know whether it's on. Oh, yeah, I think it's next week on Dynamite. That's the match. And uh, that'll be him and Aussie Open against Death Triangle. So very, very, very much looking forward to that match. Now, that do you excellent. think that they'll just do semis and finals at All Out in order to get more matches on the card and kind of give you more to look forward to at the tournament, at the uh, pay per view? Uh no, I, I think they'll do the semis on in the weeks leading up to it still, and they'll only have the final because as you thing we didn't mention on Dynamite, which is something that also annoyed me, is that uh, there's going to be a six man another trios match on the show, which is uh, Wardlow and FTR against. Jay Lethal, Sanjay Dutt, and Satnam Singh. Which feels like both an entire waste of FTR and a waste, a waste of, of Wardlow. A yeah, waste why, of Lethal, what, like... Like, Wardlow seemingly has lost all, like, focus and direction since he became champion, which isn't the way things should really be going. But it's but, always how it goes when you push a monster to the moon like that. Mm. But, anyway, that was just some more AEW stuff, but... Talk about G1, so we're, we're seemingly setting up for Okada White at Wrestle Kingdom, which Wrestle Kingdom will only be one night this year, or next year, should I say, because it's, it'll be 2023. But, uh, Love it. Yeah. I, more of this, please. There's also speculation going around that uh, there will be AEW superstars uh, showing up. I 100% think Punk versus Tanahashi is happening. That'd be good. Yeah, that would be fun if they were able to put that together. You imagine FTR, because they're the current uh, IWGP champions, will be appearing in some fashion. I imagine got Mox will be there. Archer, yeah, as well, because Archer was just featuring in the G1 as well. So he seems like one of the guys that it, it seems like the, the biggest crossover between both of them. So, yeah, there's there's plenty of stuff to uh, look forward to in the months and definitely for Wrestle Kingdom uh, 17. That'll be... That'll be a lot of fun. Definitely check out that show. And then we've got uh, more news from New Japan, which is their touring outside of the uh, outside of Japan. So they have an upcoming show, both two upcoming shows in the UK and an upcoming show in New York as well. So yes. obviously my greater interest is on the UK based one because those are shows that I will at least be attending one. I'm hope uh, tickets haven't gone on sale yet, but I'll, I'll look to be attending one, if not both of them, which would be a lot, a lot of fun. I, I enjoyed myself thoroughly in the last um, Royal Quest they did back in 2019. It's been three years since they were in the UK. Yeah. So uh, definitely going to be turning up for that one and seeing what they put together. Uh, but the uh, interesting thing about the New York show is that it appears to be, well, it appears to be they've announced it as a kind of crossover show between New Japan and Stardom. Which is good because, you know, they've established essentially that it's 2022 and they need to integrate women into their programming. They have um, the IWGP Women's Championship coming. Uh, they're also hitting New York. They're hitting the Palladium in Times Square on October 28th. And it's also the first time that they're in New York since 2019. Yeah, with the uh, the Supercard of Honor show. Now, Tony lives smack dab in the middle of Times Square. I wonder if we can convince him to <laughs> go to an NJPW show. To shake off his prejudices. Yes, <laughs> like, absolutely. Let's get him into a show that is not WWE. It should be good, though. I mean, New York shows are always major. and this is a really cool venue that no one hits. So let's see what happens. 
I'd love to see him when he comes back on to talk to us if he does go to the show and he says the truth. Yeah, so there was this one guy whose name I can't pronounce against uh, this other guy who I can't, I can't pronounce. It's, uh, I don't know, it, it was a match. It was, it yeah. was good. Yeah, I, I think that will basically be the summation of his uh, review of the show if he was to go there. But we're at very least uh, looking forward to... Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely give a bit more of a thorough review if I uh, go to Royal Quest and give you my findings it's only in London it's only like it would, it's uh yeah it's, it's taking place in London so it's like a um a one hour train uh ride away from me so definitely a lot more uh easier to get to than the previous one they did which was and it wasn't actually that far but it was in Milton Keynes which is a good like three plus hours away and also I'd never been to Milton Keynes before so I had no idea where I was going for <laughs> I had to just like try and follow a crowd of people that were wearing a new japan shirt and hopefully found my way to the arena <laughs> that's that's an adventure in itself mm. it's hard when you can't drive and you're just taking trains and public transport and just relying on relying on people to guide you but uh some a few other little updates before we get to the remainder of like tv notes and other discussions so uh sasha banks was uh burgled or at least had her car broken into which is yeah. not nice don't do uh, that guys I know that she had said, uh, enjoy the hair care products. You know, whoever you are out there, fuck you. And I hope uh, you're enjoying your hair care products. Is that why she's now gone to a more natural look? Uh, it could very well could be. I, I have to say, because she's been posting a lot more. Uh, she does look very happy on the you know, red carpet for She-Hulk and all that stuff. And it does seem like she's getting more into the idea of getting back out there. So let's see how that goes. And then again, just one line of thing before we move on to more TV talk. Um, there was some more updates on the whole Donald Trump and Vincent Mann situation, which we talked about uh, previous uh, the previous week's hot tags, where we brought up about the fact that apparently uh, there had been payments made by Vincent Mann towards the Trump Foundation. And apparently this was also in line with the a contract that was brought up between uh, Trump and McMahon or Trump's people and McMahon's people about the Battle of the Billionaires match and uh, this quite interesting quote or element of the contract which came up uh, according to the Wall Street Journal uh, a person who reviewed Trump's contract for his WrestleMania appearance stated Mr. Trump had his associates review the contract to ensure that under no circumstances would Mr. McMahon be allowed to shave his head even if Mr. Trump's wrestler dropped dead in the ring. I, Callum, I love this <laughs> so much. The idea that Donald Trump, who later in the year legitimately called Titan Towers because he thought McMahon had exploded in a limousine, <laughs> had it written in the contract, listen, I'm not cutting my hair, even if this guy dies in the middle of the ring, that that's the kind of stuff that that's where that's where I go. How does anyone take this guy seriously? It's amazing that that's actually something that was uttered by his representatives. Yeah, this is a former president of the United States basically saying, "Yeah, you. If I'm going to agree to this." Like, you're not touching my hair. Like, my guy might just collapse in the ring and your other guy has to fall on top of him. But even if, like, your guy is forced to win the match, I'm still not getting my head shaved. You're shaving your head instead. It's like, well, obviously, Vince is going to shave his head. There was no chance in hell, again, to just coin the phrase of the, the, the entrance music there, that Vince was going to win that match. There was no way that Trump was going to shave his head. Just the fact that he had to be so pernickety about it. Or, like, does that show, like, an element of, like, serious mistrust? That, yeah, of course the promoter of the wrestling company who's asked you to do this is going to be the one and has paid you seemingly millions of dollars. Like, your friend. Dollars. Yeah, like, yeah, your friend yeah. and he's, has given you millions of dollars towards your foundation to make this appearance is going to, like, honour his word and have his head shaved because... Funny enough, he's the one who's going to be there next week. You're going to go away. So who and cares it, if you're it, It's a rare moment where we have to say, yes, of course, 
Vince McMahon will keep his word. <laughs> I think records show that between the two, McMahon keeps his word a little bit more. Um, it, it's hysterical. Part of me really wishes that they would have just had them fight. Never mind the hair. Just like have them actually have the match. Because I, I think that's how it started, right? Didn't he challenge him to a match? And then they were just like, no, but instead we'll have guys represent us. Mm. Un- unreal, Callum. Unreal. <laughs> but I am glad. I know that they did their uh, financial earnings call this week. And they did say that the investigation is all but concluded. So hopefully this is the end of secret payments or whatever from Vince McMahon. Yeah, we'll have to. Uh, we'll definitely be covering that uh, as the if, when the investigation results do come out. But uh, yeah, as as of now, I know they'd had the um, the financials call this uh, week, and again, it was just what you'd expect. It was a lot of um, WWE's revenue is like at record levels. They talked about the selling ninety thousand tickets across in in twenty four hours for WrestleMania. Of course, uh, conveniently leaving out the fact that it was across two nights. So it's like, well, yeah, they, they would sell a lot of tickets for two nights worth of shows. But it's it's still an impressive number. I'm not, I don't want to take away from the number, but it's it's not like they sold 90,000 tickets for a one-day show. So, but I will say, um, with, with Vince gone, Paul Levesque was on these calls. Mm. And that got a little bit of questioning regarding creative and it was very toe the line of we're going to create iconic characters and do iconic things and yada yada but nothing major coming out of the financials call and it seems like we're in full no more Vince mode which is still different well I I can only say it'll be good to see uh, Peyton Royce and Billy Kay back in WWE then maybe uh, that is true uh, so we'll finish off with some uh, TV talk. So let's go all the way back to last week's SmackDown. As mentioned earlier, we had Raquel Rodriguez and Leah defeat Shotzi and Zaya Lee to progress to the semi-finals of the Women's Tag Team Tournament. So, yeah, that's as expected. Uh, we had Drew McIntyre promo where he talked about Karrion Cross and talked about uh, Roman Reigns and beat up both Usos. Because that's what the Usos do. They're essentially whipping boys for Roman Reigns now, even though they're the unified tag team champions. They can't even catch a fucking break when a guy gives Drew McIntyre a stunner. They still get up and get their asses beat. Yeah, we'll talk about that when we get on to Raw. Uh, big story from uh, SmackDown is the return of Hit Row. Yeah. So, so we've well, kind of seen three, that. Three, three, three quarters of Hit Row. Yeah, they're calling themselves the OG3. They're saying that the plan was always to have them in a group no matter what. So that's cool for them. I'm glad that they're back. Obviously, you know, Triple H is trying to make as much goodwill as humanly possible. And it's fine. It was a standard squash match. They will only go so far as a tag team and a valet who isn't solely focused on wrestling. So I think that is important. So no going into it, but it's cool to see them back. Uh, we had, well, a contract signing segment, which was first of all interrupted by Ronda Rousey, who showed up, threw a load of money on the uh, contract table, basically just acted like she didn't care, showed more personality than she has done, which is always the case when someone turns heel. And then she had a bit of a confrontation with Shayna Baszler. Then Liv Morgan came out. They signed the contract. They got into a brawl. Liv Morgan uh, put Shayna Baszler through a table using the Dudley Dog. So, yep, that's the match at Clash of the Castle for the SmackDown Women's title. Um, It's interesting to note that Ronda did tag this weekend with Shayna, Mm. which might have been a first time ever at a house show. And I think that's really cool. I hope that... listen. You could put the women's tag titles on Ronda and Shayna and then never move them and it wouldn't matter because they're the most legit team you could ever possibly have in wrestling. I like Ronda as a heel. Of course, the second she does anything remotely supposed to be a heel, the crowd goes nuts for her. 
and they were so excited to see her. So, you know, you, you can't really ever win in that regard. But this was fine, and I liked the swerve of, okay, they signed the contract, Baszler gets the upper hand for five seconds, but the baby face comes out on top with Liv Morgan hitting the deadly dog, as you said. Yeah, I think trying to, that was a good step in trying to rehab her a bit after the way that she defeated, quote-unquote defeated Ronda Rousey at SummerSlam. Uh, you had uh, Dream Actor and Mad Cat Moss defeat the Usos, seemingly aren't getting a title match, but, you know, that's what tag champions are there for, to lose matches with titles not on the line. Well, uh, uh, Mad Cat Moss is in the running for a title shot, as tonight they're going to do a Fatal Five way to determine who will face Gunther at Clash of the Castle. It's Madcap, Sheamus, Ricochet, and I'm forgetting the other two individuals at the moment. Let me check Fightful, but I do I do like the idea that Triple H, since he's come in, has completely put the onus on mid-card titles and rehabbing their look and their feel. It's okay, it's Madcap, Sami Zayn, Baron Corbin, Ricochet, Sheamus, and that and the winner of that will go and face Gunther. So, so I mean, Sheamus, could, please. Yeah, I I want Sheamus, but you could get your Sami Zayn Gunther match here, Callum. It's just not the NXT Sami Zayn. Yeah, I, I mean, I I would enjoy either of those options. Uh, I'm not totally against the Madcap Boss one. I just doesn't feel that doesn't feel that special. I think that they're already doing stuff with Corbin and Ricochet in a feud with each other. We already saw Ricochet and Gunter for the title. I definitely don't want to see Corbin against Gunter for the title. So Sheamus, the uh, UK Clash of the Castle, you definitely should go with Sheamus on this one, even though he's obviously not from the UK. He's he's adjacent enough to make it interesting. Uh, but we also did see an Intercontinental title match on these. Uh, as the main event of SmackDown, Nakamura versus Gunter. And this is a very, very good match between two guys that know how to beat the shit out of each other. Agreed. Uh, and you had uh, Gunter win, pinning Nakamura with the powerbomb. So that was all good. And One of say, the best times he's had matches I've seen in years. Yeah, it's not, unfortunately it's not saying much at this point, but... Uh, but yeah, it was um, it was good, and they also did a lot in the show, as they did with the United States title as well, of like showcasing the the history and the legacy of the belt as well. So it seems seemingly Triple H is paying a lot more attention to adding the prestige back to these championships that has been very uh, gradually whittled away in the last several years. But uh, I want to talk a little bit about Rampage, and it's not because there was anything really that exciting on Rampage because there wasn't, but um that's kind of actually the point where i want to bring up is like is rampage just like not important yes because <laughs> it's just because oh, yeah, it, it, yes. it, feel, it feels like dark it feels like dark like go, go for the show we had uh sammy Guevara and ty mello versus dante martin and sky blue for the triple a mixed tag team championships and like it was it was fine but it didn't feel that important, even though it was a title match, because it's titles that we that I presume most of the people watching had no idea that Sammy and Ty had. Yeah, because we, we've never seen them hold them before. And like honestly, like one of the one of the bad things with the Forbidden Door is people are just like, yeah, they're a champion of this. Like, what the hell? How often are these people wrestling? Because they're not even wrestling that much, but the way that they always have some other title. Or working some other show, it feels that way. So then we had Parker Boudreau versus uh, Sunny Kiss, which ended in about a minute with Parker just getting an easy victory. Again, didn't seem like much. I'm not super impressed with Parker's in ring stuff, but and I've also made my feelings about Sunny Kiss as a as a performer uh, clear as well. So that doesn't excite me that much. Uh, Gun Club versus Beardhausen. So we also talked about Gun Club earlier, but then they just took on Danhausen and Eric Redbeard and beat them and got chewed out by Billy Gunn afterwards. And yeah, this was just another, just felt like a real gimmick match. Not in the good way of a gimmick match. And then had Ari Davari versus Orange Cassidy as the main event. Orange Cassidy got the victory, as you'd expect. And then the big, the big angle with Rampage was Sunny Kiss came out and turned on, well, I say turned on, she was 
she was never like officially aligned with the best friends, but like essentially allowed the trust busters to beat them up. And so she is now part of the trust busters. And so they're, they're now foursome. Big deal. Listen, anything that does something with Sunny Kiss on television, though, I am going to applaud because Sunny Kiss and Best Friends, I believe. Oh, I'm sorry. I always forget Kip Sabian as well. But those four acts are the only acts that have been there since like day one and haven't gotten any major title rub. You know, they came in with hype and all that, and they haven't gotten any. Anything out of it, like so good that you're using Sunny. I don't know how far the Trustbusters will ever go, but at least it's something. Yeah, so they're gonna have their uh, trios match on Rampage. So be checking that out as well. See, I know the results are probably out there. I don't know what they are. I don't check the Rampage the spoilers. So, but. Uh, yeah, we'll see how that goes. Uh, I'm just not super into the trust busters. They don't really do anything for me. I, I don't feel any any real star power off any of them so far. So, but hopefully they can prove me wrong. And talk a little bit more about Raw. So we had, as mentioned earlier, had the Asuka and Alex Bliss winning and getting into the semifinals of the tag tournament. Uh, we had a Miz and Champa defeated Mustafa Ali and Cedric Alexander. So they're still they're still they're still a unit, Miz and Champa. No real signs of dissent between them just yet. Right. But we saw well, I guess we did see another sign of Dexter, but it wasn't towards Champa or Miz this time. It was once again apparently targeting AJ. Mm. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a bit. We had a uh, Drew McIntyre against Kevin Owens. Uh they had a I would say if the Punk and uh, Mox, yep. Mox the segment was so good, this would be <laughs> one of the best promo segments of a long time. But it was, in by WWE standards, this is one of the best uh, heated promo discussions of all time, or uh, in recent times anyway. And, uh, yeah, they got in each other's face. They told some home truths against each other. McIntyre and Owens were very animated and very more uh, intense than they have been recently. And then this led to a very intense match between the two of them. But of course, it was interrupted by the Uso, so it had a small finish. And even though, as you mentioned earlier, uh, Kevin Owens put a stunner on uh, McIntyre to leave him lane, he still managed to beat up both Usos on his own afterwards. So the Usos are really now in uh, Power Rangers putts territory. Yeah, and I, I don't like it. But I do love Kevin Owens talking about that he wants to be a champion again. And how he's found himself. I love McIntyre just naming all the future matches. I hate that we're in a place where um, Roman Reigns is already getting the Brock Lesnar treatment. Where it's like, I'm going to win this title and save the titles from you because you're not even here. I don't like that. And and, while I think it's great, I don't love that they're just like, oh fuck, we're going to say wrestling five times in a sentence and I'm glad look I'm glad they can but that was clearly a one-off statement that I don't think you need to do every single week and we had Veer Mahan win a squash match it was interesting to see Veer on TV again the last time we saw him on TV was doing some sort of weird backstage where he just said boo to to Kayla Braxton well, what else could you need and uh yeah, so it's a, we've had Veer this week. We had Omos the previous week. It seems that we're back to those those two just having squash matches. Which I'm, I'm good with. I, I think that they there is a spot for them on the show. And, uh, you know, yeah, I, 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 I mean, I guess so. But it's like, they're, they're seemingly, they don't really have any faith in either of them as actual, you know, guys to be involved in actual feuds. So is the kind of just reason like, okay, we'll just put you in squash matches with because you do decent YouTube numbers because of well one of them due to your massive size and one of you and due to your nationality. Yeah. 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 Uh okay, either way. Uh we had uh Bobby Lashley defend the United States Championship against AJ Styles. Uh had involvement from Champa, Miz, Dexter Loomis, but Lashley did manage to retain relatively clean. 
So, but yeah, it's just another good United States title match. They're making Lashley into a, a very fighting champion, so that's good to see. Yeah, and I like this Dexter Loomis thing. I like that he's not just back with the company. He's being weird about it. And maybe next week he gets on the apron or maybe even into the ring. But I like that they're dragging it out. Uh, we had Dakota Kai defeat Dana Brooke and deciding that, uh, like most people, that the 24-7 championship is beneath her to the point where she didn't even want to challenge for the title in the match itself. So, so Sean Ross Sapp tweeted out a picture of the hardcore title. And listen, I would love to see the hardcore title without the 24-7 rule replace the 24-7 title. It'd be interesting to see because they're, obviously they're, there's obviously been rumours for the last couple of weeks about WWE moving towards TV14 products, or at least on Raw. Right. So having a hardcore title would kind of fit into that mindset a little more if they could allow a little more blood or at least a bit more violence in matches. And it'd be interesting who they got to be part of that division because none of them really scream hardcore to me. Yeah, that is something. I mean... You'd have to rebuild it with new guys like a Loomis or a Solisakoa or Von Wagner, you know? Mm. And then the main event of the show, we had Fury, who hadn't appeared for the last couple of weeks, so it was nice to see him back. I say nice, I don't really care. But Fury was back, and he took on Dolph Ziggler. That's all about things I don't care about. And, uh, yeah, they had, a, uh, they had a match, and Fury actually won a match, defeated Dolph Ziggler, but that is kind of what Dolph Ziggler is there for. I think this was good. I, look, it didn't end... The highway that Raw has been ending since Triple H took over, but I think that this was the right thing to do. So that was Raw, and that was the I pretty much talked about every other bit about this week's uh, TV. And I think that covers pretty much all we need to talk about for the hot tags, unless there's anything else you feel like we need to bring up. No, I think we covered it all, and I think this was another great episode with a, a lot of news that happened seemingly late in the week, but you never know what's going to happen in the world of wrestling and i'm sure by the time we get to you next week with tony back there'll be a bunch of other stuff that no one could have seen coming yep so as mentioned next week we will be back to kind of more of business as usual as a trio rather than just you hearing uh tony's disembodied voice uh from previous uh weeks coming back towards you most recently we had our uh top rope list for the best of british wrestlers so if, if you haven't checked that out yet be sure to Check it out as the previous episode and go back and listen to all the other stuff we've done on repeat in a loop every single, right. every hour on the hour. Just just be listening to our voices, everything that we do. And I don't know what the plan is for next week. Again, that will just be something that comes up a bit more on the fly. But we'll soon be doing our prediction shows for the entirety of the stuff that's happening uh, in wrestling. In fact, uh, Yes, because very soon, on September 3rd, we have Clash at the Castle, and on September 4th, we have both uh, All Outs and uh, Worlds Collide. So there is a lot to do Feels previews like old for. times, you yeah, know? Just, yeah, it's back to being uh, just multiple wrestling shows at the same weekend that we have to do lots of preparation for, a lot of uh, post shows, a lot of previews, a lot of stuff to look forward to. Like even in that segment alone, in that, in that little block alone, you're looking at free prediction shows and free uh, post shows. Depending on when things go out, we might not be able to do a post show for NXT, just depending on what time it goes out against uh, All Out. Because I, I don't know about you, I think I'd prefer to do the All Out post show. But then again, you probably wouldn't be able to do the All Out post show because you'd be working. I will not be able to do the All Out post show because Tony Khan will be talking to the media until like 3 a.m. So, mm. you know. How that works. Yeah. I, I I would look forward to whatever Punk's uh, post, uh, post uh, show press conference will be like. But uh, we'll look forward to that as well. So that's all the stuff that's in the pipeline. Again, next week's one is a bit more up in the air, but uh, I'm sure we'll have something laid out by the time that you listen to us around about sometime midweek, probably Wednesday, but it could be, could be earlier, could be slightly later. And then the hot tags, as per usual, next week on Friday. 
uh in the meantime definitely should be subscribing to this uh, channel if you haven't done so already hit the like button leave a comment below if you've enjoyed the stuff talked about and leave your thoughts on our thoughts on what we discussed already uh already mentioned the patreon earlier and being a member as well but there are other ways you can support us of course there is just checking out the website in general just browsing across all of the uh all the content that's going out there the weekly articles including my power rankings checking out the fantasy league as well and all this other great content that's going out on a regular basis and letting tony know that uh sim punk is now heel even though he's not actually heel but he might be heel that's uh i'm sure tony would love to uh hear your thoughts on that and then we have uh there's the mega maniacs as well facebook group so if you want to join that and get into some discussion about some of the topics especially in the lead up to clash of the castle and all out that's usually the point where we have little pay-per-view threads as well and you can get in your discussion as the show is going on so be involved in that as well and there's also fanboys anonymous which is the sister set website to smart Cow moment it's more involved in the geek culture side of things movies television comic books video games if you're interested in any of that stuff then check out fanboysanonymous.com Go check them out on their Patreon as well. There's Red Bull Tea Public stuff as well. Check them out on YouTube as well. All great stuff going on there. And talk, being of great stuff, Rob's always getting involved in plenty of great stuff in the world of wrestling. Well, thank you. And if you want to see more of that, you can follow me everywhere at Dude Felice. And you can check out everything I've got going on here and at Fightful.com. And check out Fightful Select because Sean Ross Apps always working really hard. And yeah, I'll see you next week. Yep, that's uh, plenty of uh, great stuff to look forward to. As I say, if um, there is plenty of wrestling news going up, then he'll be one of the first people to let you know about. I also want to um, plug something that uh, you did recently, that uh, if you if you wouldn't mind. Oh, yes, that's uh, absolutely, yes. Please do. Uh, so Rob recently uh, did a interview with uh, Tom Talks Rubbish on his, uh, on his work with Fight for Wrestling, and I checked out that interview. I found it very insightful, very interesting. I would say I, I speak to Rob, Rob on a very regular basis, but it's always good to get his um, his thoughts on things and his um, insights into, especially they talk about like disability awareness as well. So that's really uh, that was a really cool interview. So congratulations on that. Well, thank you. And yes, you should absolutely check out my interview with Tom. And it was a great interview. It does turn into a lot of disability awareness talk, but it was fantastic and I look forward to doing more. Yeah, absolutely. And you can check me out at Wigmeister14. So if you want to follow me on Twitter, that's the place to, to check out. And that's it for all of us. So thank you very much for checking out this latest edition, episode 559. We look forward to seeing you again for episode 560. Ever getting ever closer towards those 600. Uh, it's just years and years. They just fly by. <laughs> but uh, again, thanks for checking us out. And we'll speak to you again when we speak to you. But for now... This has been another smart count moment, and we are being counted out. Bye.